In 1936, most of Isaac Newton's alchemical papers would come up for auction. The famous economist John Keynes would buy them, and after some study, would declare that Newton was not the first in the age of reason, he was the last in the age of magicians. Undoubtedly one of, if not the greatest mind in science, Isaac Newton is renowned as a researcher, pushing discovery and understanding of the world into a new era. Seen by many as a modern skeptic, who helped to bring in an age of reason and materialism, and by others as a dark arts practitioner masquerading as an intellectual, in this video I hope to explain Newton's true beliefs and actions as it relates to alchemy in more esoteric schools. The father of both physics and calculus, Isaac Newton was born Christmas Day 1642 in Lincolnshire, Britain. His father had died three months previously and he would be sent to live with his grandmother. He would be educated at the King's School in Grantham, where he would receive a classical education learning both Latin and Greek. At 19, he would attend Trinity College and the University of Cambridge. Although he was a relatively unremarkable student, this would be the beginning of his development of calculus, and shortly after graduating, he would return to Cambridge as a Fellow of the Trinity, joining the likes of Niles Bohr and Francis Bacon. In 1696, he would be appointed as the Warden of the Royal Mint before rising to the position of the Master of the Royal Mint in 1699. Although these appointments were generally viewed as honorifics or sincures, having a salary and authority, but with no actual work required, Newton would take these positions seriously. In an unprecedented move, he would disguise himself and frequent bars and taverns to gather evidence of counterfeiters, believing that 20% of the currency of England was counterfeit. At that time, counterfeiting was a capital punishment, and it is estimated that 28 executions were performed while Newton was at the Mint, with many coming due to his own personal investigation. However, his covert operations would not be restricted to the financial matters and would dip into alchemy. Before we start, it's important to explain Isaac Newton's religious beliefs and how they influenced his views. Although he would sign the 39 Articles, the basis of doctrine for the Church of England, he would hold radical beliefs. Although still believing in most of the Christian doctrines, Newton would disagree on the person of Christ and the nature of the Trinity. He would reject the doctrine that held that God existed as three persons who share one essence, saying that it wasn't supported by scripture or logic, believing that Christ was a created being not equal to the Father. Having studied early church councils, he would side with Arius, who had been denounced as a heretic at the First Council of Nicaea. Newton believed that this is when a great apostasy had a Newton believed that this is when a great apostasy had occurred, and that the church had gone astray ironically making the most famous member of Trinity College an anti-Trinitarian. Nevertheless, he still believed that the Bible held divine truth. That, and his focus on mathematics and calculus, would lead him into numerology. For those who don't know, numerology is the idea that certain numbers can have a greater level of significance. You're probably familiar with 666 being associated with the devil, or the number 7 being believed to be lucky. Now, it's unlikely that Newton believed numbers held true power, as some numerologists did, but rather that they coincided with a divine and ordered system that could be used to explain the physical and supernatural worlds. He would particularly study the book. Both biblical books focused on prophecy and apocalyptic visions. After his death, his uncovered writings showed a prediction that the second coming of Christ and the end of the world would not occur until after 2060. Newton did not share this belief with others during his life likely due to his personal disdain of people who would try to predict the end of the world and spread their belief. He would also come to the belief that the Pope, or more specifically the papal office, was the Antichrist, linking him to the number 666 and viewing the papal church as the fulfillment of the prophecy of the beast as described in the book of Revelations, although this was a fairly common Protestant belief in his day. Newton would relate this numerology somewhat to architecture, as mentioned earlier, Newton's belief in God led him to believe in divine languages that had been used to order the cosmos, specifically geometry. He wouldn't view geometry as a mere human invention, but took a more Platonist view that the universe is built on mathematical principles. To this end, he would study the measurements and designs of both the Temple of Solomon and the Great Pyramid of Giza. In his unpublished work, The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, he would attempt to determine the length of the sacred cubit from decoding the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, believing it could relate to determining wider truths about the world. Hermeticism, a belief that ancient Egypt had accessed hidden wisdom, was very popular at the time, and some believed that Newton was part of the Recrucians, 
a secret mystic society focused on Egypt, although there is scant evidence for this. In the same work, he would discuss the Temple of Solomon, the first temple built by the ancient Jews. For those who don't know, the Temple of Solomon is rife with numerous conspiracy theories. From ancient legends that King Solomon bound dark powers to build the temple, to the heavy relation between Freemasonry, it is a topic of much discussion. Newton would make many detailed sketches of the temple, trying to recreate the blueprint from descriptions of biblical texts. However, it is doubtful he believed in some of the more modern theories, and instead would focus on how the design and the proportions could be connected to the natural laws and principles governing the universe. Newton's first recorded alchemical experiments would start in 1678, where he would work alone in a private laboratory. A large portion of his writing on alchemy would be lost due to a fire, limiting what we know about his work. England had also outlawed many alchemical practices at this time, out of concern of fraudsters and the creation of fake gold that could destabilize the economy, likely leading Newton to not record some of his experiments. What has been published can be seen on the Newton Project, an online depository of a large amount of Newton's writings. There are hundreds of thousands of words written by Newton on alchemy, describing a range of protocols and lab experiments, with excerpts taken from other famous alchemical works. Newton's writings are incredibly disorganized, highly technical, and often written in Latin if not in cryptic ciphers, making it very confusing to try to understand a large portion of his work. One thing that is known of Newton's work is his attempt to create a philosopher's stone. Often considered to be the pinnacle of alchemical pursuits, the philosopher's stone is said to be able to transmute base metals into gold and even produce an elixir of immortality. This was before atomic theory, and a common belief was that all matter was made from a combination of four fundamental substances, earth, wind, fire, and air, with gold simply being a perfect purified substance that had a balance of all elements. These ideas go all the way back to ancient Greece, with philosophers such as Empedocles and Aristotle. The concept of humors also comes from this, and in the same way a person's humors could be balanced, it was thought so could metals. Robert Boyle, often considered the first modern chemist, lived at the same time as Newton, and seemed to have also had an interest in alchemy. He would petition the Royal Mint to allow him to perform experimentation to determine if the transmutation of base metals into gold could be achieved. Although not close friends, Boyle and Newton were members of the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge, and would have some correspondence. Newton would even write to Henry Allenberg, stating that he thought Boyle may have discovered a new type of mercury and hoped that he would remain secretive out of concern that the mercury is a true sophic mercury, a key ingredient in the creation of a philosopher's stone. When Boyle died in 1691, the executive of his estate, the famous philosopher John Locke, would send Newton some of Boyle's works, including his formula for the creation of red earth. Red earth was thought to be able to assist in the transmutation of metals similar to the philosopher's stone, but to a much lesser extent. The following year, Newton would suffer a severe mental break lasting 18 months. His writings at the time would describe numerous experiments with toxic chemicals, including determining the taste of mercury, describing it as strong and sour. In a personal letter in 1693, he would say he, quote, have neither ate nor slept well in the last 12 months, nor have my former consistency of mind. Even though at the time there was a growing suspicion of the toxicity of mercury and other metals, the full danger was not yet known. It is thought that his exposure to lead, mercury, arsenic, and a host of other chemicals caused his mental issues. At the time of his death in 1725, his hair would show levels of mercury and lead indicating chronic poisoning, as well as very high levels of arsenic and other toxic metals used in lead alloys. Although he believed he was making progress, Newton never succeeded in creating a philosopher's stone. As for what else Newton's experiments produced, we simply don't know. Although there are volumes and volumes of lab books and writings, as mentioned earlier, many are almost impossible to understand. Alchemists have a habit of writing using codenames for materials, leaving out steps in a formula, or even adding in extra ones. Newton would spend decades trying to decipher previous texts from famous alchemists, and hundreds of years in the future, so are we. He writes using terms like green lion and two snakes, and it's unknown to what he is referring to. From what we do know of his work, William Newman, a professor of history and science, says some of the compounds Newton was able to create haven't been reproduced to this day. 
It's important to note that in Newton's day, there wasn't a harsh distinction between alchemy and chemistry as there is today. However, there was a distinction between magic and alchemy, and Newton would be highly critical of occult beliefs. He would write, Hermetic art is nothing more than the use of nature's principles, but many make use of their imaginations and make things seem to be what they are not, pretending that it is magic when it is merely the workings of nature. Although his focus on celestial bodies have led some to believe that he supported astrology, in a letter to John Locke he would say, I do not see how astrology can be justified by the laws of nature. Seeing the stars have no such influence upon us as astrology pretends. The true science of the stars is that of their motion, which is the study of astronomy. I hope this gave you some insight into Newton's more unknown work. At the time he lived, there was a much higher connection between theology and the natural sciences. From calculus to numerology, geometry to sacred geometry, and chemistry to alchemy, all of his pursuits retained an analytical and scientific perspective, and he's truly worthy of his position in history. Thanks for watching. Later.